Is any of it working? Is this, it's not working? Oh, my gosh. Oh, this one's there. Yeah, we'll make sure this doesn't work. I hear, I hear it out there. Okay. That thing's good. Can I just turn it on? No, you can see it. Not with this. Okay. I just want to do everything. Sermon mic. All right, that thing works. I can hear. I can hear. I can hear it. Y'all can hear. Y'all can hear. We hear you, John. All right. I know. Y'all hear me enough. I don't need to hear me anymore. <laughs> Look, I got confused. A lot of noise. Confused. But we, we opened up a big old can of worms last week talking about money. Yeah, you did. Yeah. And uh, and then I'm like, oh, man, where do we start? So I thought we started Genesis. And I got some kind of analysis. I, I learned some stuff. I really did. Uh, money's all up in the Bible. and uh, But it doesn't, you know, it's not like capitalism and money. And it says God and mammon, and we don't use the word mammon. Like, there's a bunch of language in the Bible that, like, we have this American version of, so, like, we don't even understand what they're talking about. Like, God's kingdom, like the kingdom of God. We're not looking around. We don't see kingdoms. Like, you know, you know what I mean? Like, you think of, like, some like some king, like, you know, Prince Arthur or something, you know, and it's, like, weird and archaic and old, and we don't see it that way, and, like, we just see stuff different, and, if you don't understand a kingdom, then you can't understand God's way of doing things. He's king. It's not a democracy. It's like there's just king and his servants and and everything. So there's a lot of stuff in the scripture that way. So you have to be a little bit imaginative. So uh, so so it doesn't say that much about money in uh, Genesis. But what represented money for a long time? What has always represented wealth in the world before there was paper money? You know where they could print. Possession. Yeah, yeah. If, if you're talking, if you get fiat money out of the way, what's left? You know, you have gold, right? Gold was considered, right? Gold, like you know, it's like considered the you know, wealth. I mean, yeah, you have cattle. And I'm saying there were people who were rich and that kind of stuff, but they had gold. And so I saw this thing where you like where you looked at gold, and Genesis has got a bunch of mentions of gold, and it's kind of profound because gold is like what else is it? I mean. We value copper and, and, and everything, but why gold? Why, what's so good about gold? It doesn't corrupt. Uh, it, it, it doesn't tarnish and fade away. It just kind of lasts. And so, uh, so gold might uh, uh, be a good way of seeing what God says about uh, wealth and how it was originally intended. There's another thing in the scripture, and this is sort of an interpretation sort of thing. But like for, for instance, like there's rules for interpretation. One of the major byproducts of us being here and talking every week, I hope, is that we can all get a sense of how we ought to read the Bible responsibly. So, for instance, like one rule of interpretation is context. You know what I mean? So if you have a verse and it's right here, you can't just arbitrarily decide what that verse is without reading the ones above it and below it. You know what I mean? And if it doesn't work with the ones above it and below it, you're taking it out of context. The other thing you do is you take the Bible and you, they call it proof texting. You can say, well, obviously, you use this over here, this over here, this over here. And what we've done is fashioned the Bible to, to support what we're saying instead of reading the Bible and saying what it's saying, or at least trying to understand what it's saying to support it. Another ma major thing in, in the scripture, you got to define words. That's a big deal because a lot of words, are, you know, it's the original language stuff. And it's not that hard to do, guys. You can just type it in and Google it and be like, what does this word mean? And most of the time, it's like sand means sand. Like it's, but, but but it's good to know the language and stuff. Just like kingdom, you know. Oh, well, we understand what kingdom means, but do we really? Have we ever lived in a kingdom? You know, and, and, and we should study that more and say, no, 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 no. It's not democracy. It's not autonomy. It's a kingdom with a king and has a domain and there's an authority and an authority structure and there are delegates, delegates and there's stuff and there's a place and that king is in charge of there. And we should be thinking of God and us and stuff and how we uh, fit into that narrative and say, oh, so God's really, you know, this way or that way. You know what I mean? And so we do that and all the time, like, friends, like, just get on. You t there's good people, bad people. We're talking about God, what God does, what God doesn't do. Uh, and so we just have to be careful about that stuff. A huge thing that you could do for interpretive uh, practice to try to understand what God is saying about something, God is a change. And so his scripture is, uh, uh, is whole. It's comprehensive and it's whole. And so there's this thing called the law of first mention where you, you, you got, God doesn't change. And so the things that are introduced early on, he doesn't deviate from those things. Like if he introduces it in Genesis, that theme remains and it's built upon through the scriptures. It's not like he starts in Genesis and he's like, wow, I changed my mind, changed a bunch of stuff. 
And it seems like there's some stuff like that, but God just doesn't change. He's building on himself. He doesn't have to do that. And so all the scripture, the, the tapestry of scripture weaves together beautifully. Okay, and the themes and motifs are perfect. And so listen, if you want to understand something about the Bible, it's great because you look all through the Bible and get a great picture of what God is saying. You look in the context in Genesis. You look in the context of the Old Testament. You look in the context of Psalms. You look in the context of Proverbs and wisdom books. And then the context in the Gospels and the context in the epistles. And all that stuff is going to be showing you what God is saying, has always been saying about stuff, right? And so we look at gold and gold in Genesis. Gold is mentioned eight times in Genesis. Now, I'm not big into numerology and all that stuff, but it's mentioned eight times. And uh, that stuff's important because, uh, because it just is. Uh, uh, God uh, mentions it eight times. So, like, number one, you know, one is unity. Just so you know, like, one is unity in the Bible. Two is uh, separation or holiness. Three is the number for God. Four is the number of the earth. You know, there's, like, four winds and four corners of the earth, which is curious, four corners. Uh, four seasons. Yeah, so four is a number for the earth. Five is a number for grace. Six is a number for man, also a number for falsehood. Seven is a number for completion. We know seven days. Eight, though, what's eight the number of? Infinity, okay, or eternity, or abundance. You let that letter eight fall, and it becomes infinity, you know? And so uh, the number eight, that's what a lot of people think. Everything in Genesis was on purpose. For instance, the first mention in, the, in Genesis of love. They used to do this. Rabbis would do this because their students would have to memorize the whole Torah. So they would say, what's the first mention of love? And they'd have to know where the first mention. Well, the first mention of love in Genesis is when God says, Abraham, uh, says to, uh, Abraham, take your son, Isaac, your one and only son, whom you love, to the mountain and sacrifice him there. So love, it's, isn't that cool? Because you see the first mention of the whole Bible of love has to do with God directing uh, the, the patriarch to go and to sacrifice his son on behalf of God. It was just a crazy thing to do. Uh, and it's a picture of God's love, right? So, like, you start swimming around, and you, you, it's fun because you'll connect all these dots, and, and it'll, 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 it'll increase your faith. It'll help you because you'll, you'll say, I'm not just making stuff up here. We're not just getting these things from nowhere. There's a rich history here, and there's a lot to be gained from our study. So, uh, so anyway, so, so eight times in the scripture, gold. Now, here's the thing that I feel like I've learned from this. I kind of was like, well, money's kind of bad because the love of money is root of all evil, and it's like temptation, and, you know, it's likened to, to you know, and we see all the effects of bad money, and, and, and you know what I mean? And, and, and it's just a bad reputation, but like we all want it, but like, you know what I mean? So Christians were stuck in the middle because... We kind of feel like it's bad, and we find, feel like we're supposed to be poor, and then we feel like we're bad if we're rich, and it's all kind of weird just stuff concerning it. I think this dispels that because in Genesis, first mentioning of gold, gold is always for and mentioned with, uh, is in conjunction with God's people. That's the only place it's mentioned, the only way it's, that it's mentioned in the book of Genesis. Well, that's what I thought. Was weird. I've always thought that gold was weird. I mean, who is, like, I wouldn't want a gold-plated guitar. If I did, I'd sell it just to somebody, some idiot that wanted it, you know, to get the money. Like, I just thought, it's just, just you know, I mean, just some gold. Like, I don't know. My, I guess my rings are gold, kind of. But I think they're just gold-plated, you know? It just doesn't, just doesn't matter to me so much. But why did put God put gold anywhere? And why is it so valuable? And why is it so precious? And where are the origins of it all? At least the Bible Show some interesting things here. So seven times, okay, seven times God says it is good uh, in, uh, no, eight times God says it is good in Genesis as well. Seven times he's talking about creation. The eighth time he mentions something being good, it is in Genesis 11, 12, and he says it's the gold. He says the gold is good. Strange stuff. All right, we're going to look at a couple of them here. But I think that this is this is just what I'm starting, okay? And we're going to stay here for a couple weeks, and y'all have all the, you can disagree with me. Uh, but the original intention of wealth is for God's people is, I think, where I'm at. And I did not necessarily think that last week. I don't think I would have said that last week. This is Genesis 2. This first place to go is mentioned in the Bible. Uh, we're going to go to 11, uh, uh, Laura, if we can.
The name of the first is Pishon, is uh, where there is gold. Okay, so so what does God do? It, God tells them where the gold is, and he says, that's good. Y'all need to go up there. That's where it is. God puts it there. He puts it there. He tells them that it is there. So there's this idea of providence, like God is saying that gold is for you. You need to go over there. That's where that gold is, and it's good. It's good. So we have this first mention of gold. He's locating that gold. He's saying it's also there. The gold of that land is good. Who's he talking to? He's talking to his people. Go over there. If I told you, hey, there's some land over there, go, the gold is good. You're going to go and sell everything you have and buy that land because that's what you need to do. There's a reason for that is the point. All right, Genesis 13, 2. All right, it's the next one. Abraham, talking about Abram, Abram had become very wealthy, not just wealthy, but very wealthy. And that's the father of your faith. Is it bad to be wealthy? Abraham become very wealthy. God doesn't just tell us why. We might argue, oh, he's rich in faith. And he's rich in good looks. Very wealthy in livestock and in silver and in gold. And so it is a sign of wealth. It's given to Abraham on the front end. God tells him where the gold is that's good. He calls it good. And so it's supposed to be possessed to some degree, at least from this, by God's people. Abraham had become very wealthy in livestock and silver and in gold. Uh, there's a place uh, a little bit down, or yeah, further down. So Abraham is going to get, uh, he wants his son to be married. Abraham's very rich. He sends out his servant. It's a beautiful story. You can read about it in Genesis 24 to go. And the servant goes to find uh, Isaac, a wife. Uh, and uh, the servant goes, and when the camels had finished drinking, the man took out the gold nose ring and gold brace. He starts giving gold out. He's like, hey, I'm, I'm representing my master, and I'm trying to look for a wife, and uh, here's some gold. <laughs> and look, what, as you can imagine, like, he's, people are glad to help him out. Like, <laughs> come on, like, here you go, where you need to go. Everywhere he goes, he's giving gold to these people. And they could, are convinced very quickly that this daughter needs to be married off to this man because this man needs a husband, uh, I mean a wife, and everything that the, the master has can be given to the son, and it's a good thing, it's a good deal. And that goal was proof of that, a surety of that. And so it was proof of God's blessing, okay? It was, it was almost assurance that God was blessing. It was afforded uh, in order to get things. And so this guy is giving people gold. All right, the next mention is, uh, well, here you go. The Lord has blessed my master abundantly and has become very wealthy. He has given him sheep and cattle, silver and gold, male and female servants, and camels and donkeys. It's just showing wealth. Uh, I think there's a couple more where they keep mentioning gold. You can go to the next one, Laura. Okay, this is the next one. So that was the, uh, that story. All right, this is the only one where gold is mentioned. It's not fully in conjunction with uh, believers, okay? Pharaoh. But what's Pharaoh do? He takes off his gold ring and, and, his, and his gold chain, and he gives it to Joseph. So you have this provision once again. It is symbolizing God and God's provision to his people. It was his people. It was for it was for his people. And I really can't come up with any other conclusions about it. I'm just talking about first mention, book of Genesis, and we're talking about gold, which has represented wealth in all of cultures for all of humanity. To me, that's new. I don't know. I'm like, that's new. I, I just didn't think that. And I, and I didn't think about God creating this stuff and wanting it to be used purposefully and used well. And, and it's not. And uh, because because you probably already asked the question, well, God designed gold and wealth to be given to his people, and he wanted them to be rich. Why would he want to do that? What would be the purpose there? And why is that not happening today, right? Like you're like, well, I'm not, I mean, why are we not rich if we're following God? It's a great questions. I don't know that I can, uh, I can answer all of them today. Uh, but I think that those are massive things to consider. You have to look at the whole, and I'll explain to you guys what I think uh, here with the time we have. But it says, uh, let's see, get my handwritten notes out here a little bit. 
So here's, here, here, here's where I'm thinking. God is a God of abundance. He says, I've come and you might have life and have it to the abundance, have it to the full amount. You look in uh, the, the feeding stories, feeding 5,000. It's proving God is God of abundance. How much do you have? It's enough. Start passing out the people. There was more than enough. They took 12 baskets away. Why 12 baskets away? Pastor, why 12 baskets away? Because each of you boys need to remember the lesson today. Carry your basket. There's more than enough. Okay? God is a God of abundance. He's saying fullness. He's saying freedom. He's saying eternal life. He's saying quality, quantity. He's saying blessing, joy, peace, abundance. Like those, that's the language of God. It's not the language of Satan. Satan's language is slavery. Like God's a king. He wants you to be a king too, just under his command. A daughter under his command. Satan is a king of the world. He wants you to be a slave under his command. They are so different. Satan is saying, not very much. Not a lot. If you don't believe me, what's the first temptation? First temptation, Jesus concerned a lack. It concerned his flesh and a need and a lack. And this temptation is that there's not enough and you've got to make more, Jesus. You've got to make more. Satan always getting us shrewd, getting more greedy and there's not enough and we have to worry and there's got to be fear and there's got to be anxiety and there's got to be you know that's who has an interest in doing that kind of stuff to us the three things the three ways that he has attacked us the world the flesh and the devil himself if you look at those temptations the, that first temptation is an issue of the flesh jesus was hungry all right and there was a lack and he's like why don't you create that use your power to create that all right the devil is obviously the devil. We know that. But the, the, what's the world? Um, I, I've got it written here, and I think it's uh, that the, the world is like this ambition that we have. Like we're tempted to, uh, to uh, we just want to be seen good, you know, in front of people. So like the worldly thing is to always sort of chase that. And Jesus' second temptation is like, He's like, look, you throw yourself down. He's written about you, and people think well of you, and because God will save you, He'll bear you up so you don't dash your foot against the stone. So that was a worldly temptation about what people thought, about what people thought. Uh, but in Luke four, can we do Luke four? Is there, it might be hard to do, but in Luke four, there's this other temptation, and it's Satan doing it himself. It is different than Matthew, and I should have put this in here, Lord. I'm really sorry, but it's different than Matthew because. He takes him up to this high place so we can see all the kingdoms and all of everything in the whole world. He's like, and what does Satan say? He says, all of these, uh, the devil led him to the high place, showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. Now look, I was telling you, kingdoms, right? Kingdoms. And he said, I'll give you all of their authority and, and or power and glory. It has been given to me and I can give it to who any to anyone I want. Did you know? Did you know that it has been given? It, it's been given to him. So to me, this is just where I'm at this week. Uh, God wanted us. God intended for His people to have that, to use that, to bless the world, to protect the world, to help the world, to be a vice reason to use that. It's good. It's not bad. It's good. It's good. But we did it. We misused it. And see, Satan didn't have any of that authority. He got it from us. We gave him that authority. So the way that a kingdom works is you have a king. Now, you guys in the military understand this. You have a person in charge. And authority is all about alignment, okay? It's all about alignment. You just have to align with your authority. I mean, spiritual authority, all authority works the same way. It's not a matter of do you want to do it or not. It's a matter of what did your authority tell you to do, and are you going to do that or not? And if you don't do that, then you're outside of your authority. And in God's structure, we're under his authority. And the reason why we're under his authority is he's got work for us to do. We're authorized towards specific tasks and stuff in the world. He authorized to do this. God creates in the beginning. He creates creation, like God says, let there be light, and there's light, and there's creation. 
He creates creatures and creeping things and living things and plants and everything. And he creates us, which are more like creators. Or like, we're more like these vice regents. We're like little mini gods. And we're supposed to be in charge of the world and the creatures and the animals and everything. We're supposed to take care of it. That's our job, okay, to fill the earth and subdue it. That's a creation mandate. It's what we're supposed to do. And wealth and gold also to be a part of that, to accomplish those purposes. But we gave that authority away. We didn't do that like we were supposed to. You look, Cain kills Abel. And next thing you know, Cain is building kingdoms. And Seth is building, Seth is building altars. Those two things start to divide. And kingdoms are being built up. Kingdoms against kingdoms. Right? Satan is saying, well, all these kingdoms and all this authority is mine. All the power that comes with that, all the glory that comes with that has been given to me, and I'll give it to whomever I choose. Jesus does not argue with him. And so if you want to know why, maybe... Maybe a bunch of bad people are rich. It's because Satan's got all this. He's wanting to build kingdoms against God and build all that stuff and leverage all that stuff against God. And Christians are, I think we have our head in the sand a little bit. Satan can't really create evil. He can just distort good. He can just pervert good. So Satan won't take away good things for you, he'll just convince you that they're not good. He'll, he'll convince you this stuff is not good. I have this written down here. I thought this was a good principle. It says, uh, uh, where is it? I don't want to always read my writing good. I, I, I like typed writing better, but I like this little pad. Uh, I don't even have it. I lost it. I lost it. Oh, yeah. So he wants to make yeah, for what's for what's against you and against what's for you. So he wants to uh, make you for what's against you and against what's for you. Isn't that good? It sounds like Adrian Rogers. For what's against you and against what's for you. So Christians were like, well, wealth, not supposed to have that. It's really more spiritual to be humble and poor, like like Jesus. And like, and we do this other garbage where we're like oh I give 10% it unlocks wealth to me and uh, like the other 90% is going to just do like all this stuff like you could do the right thing with 10% and the wrong thing with 90% when we think that like it's going to be blessed 100% is probably not true probably not true uh, uh, all the time I think that this is what's happening and what did we do we got out of God's authority like we didn't we didn't take our rightful place in it. And we're not using it. We're not even seeing wealth as a, a means for kingdom work or a means for good or a means for God or a means for blessing to be passed down generation to generation to generation. Look, the word Abba means like uh, father uh, and house. Like Abba is the father in the house. And, you know, if, if, if you're not providing for your family, so if you're worse for an unbeliever, that means it's like, man, we're supposed to be providing for our families. And then, the, the, but then we're like, oh, but our kids, they're just going to like work hard. From, I'm not going to give them anything. But well, all of us have been given stuff. And we ought to be considering the generations after us and the things that are uh, being preserved after us. And wealth could be tools for those kinds of things. I'm not, uh, it's weird because too many people are doing a prosperity gospel thing. And, uh, and, and you know, it, it's funny. We, we don't, we, we got to be careful about that. But is it possible that we've been deceived and we're sticking our head in the sand, and we're not using this appropriately. We're not in our rightful place. We're not even seeing wealth in its proper place in terms of what God wants to do. And by the way, it's all God's. We keep talking about like it's all God's anyway, you know. And so, how does it work, and how are we supposed to do that? It's a real mess. And I'm not saying I have it all explained or anything, but I am saying to me this week, I'm like, oh wait, God didn't make everything, and He didn't just decided to make all the bad people rich. And for us to be poor, necessarily, it's just maybe that we aren't seeing that. We're not using that. We're not, we're not pushing into how that's supposed to be uh, leveraged for the good of the, of the earth. All right, there's a scripture that uh, I want to use uh, in uh, 2 Corinthians 11 real quick. And uh, Paul says this. Paul says, I'm afraid that just as Eve was deceived by the serpent's cunning, your mind may somehow be led astray from your sincere and pure devotion. To Christ. So Satan's toolbox is the same it's always been. 
He's always been doing the same things he's always been doing. All right, and he is crowning kingdoms with money and evil people with money all stacked against God's rule, God's authority, God's church. He's doing everything he can to disrupt that in this world. That's why there's a bunch of rich people over than the bad people. But I believe, friends, we do what we're saying. We do what we say we're going to do. We try hard. We work hard. It says you reap what you sow. Here's another great thing I think is really true about us idiots, okay, Christians. We're like, oh, if I give 10%, oh, what, okay. We think that this is a huge lie. I'm sorry. One minute. We think, we believe in magic. Like, we're like, oh, if I give God 10%, it will be magic with the other 90. Like, it will magically be blessed and magically multiply. Magically, I won't have to worry about it. Magically, I won't have to keep a checkbook. Magically, I'll spend the kind of money I want to. Magically, I can have all the blessings that I want to. And magically, you'll go broke. Because it's working and saving and being responsible and actually just caring. Do you think God cares about your money or not? It's a huge portion of our freedom, our life, our everything, our identity. It's all wrapped up in there. Do you think God cares about that? Yeah. He doesn't just care about the 10%. He cares about the 100%. And I'm not saying give it all away. I'm just saying manage it all. Steward. We know in the scripture, he tells one talent to one guy, uh, two talents to another guy, five talents to another guy. He wants stewardship. Give it a guy to the, the one to the guy that's got 10. We got work to do. Stewardship. So all we have to be asking is, are we God's people? Are we God's children? Are we aligned with his authority? If we're aligned with the story that all the provision, all the protection, everything that we will need will happen. And look, apple trees don't, don't push hard to make apples. They just be themselves. And the fruit will come. I don't think that we need to go out trying to get rich and everything. But if you will do what God tells you, I think if you, if you will use the principles God's used you, Go look in Proverbs. He's saying, well, pay attention to the ant. You know, like, pay attention. Don't be an idiot. Like, he says, hey, if you're going to build a tower, well, make sure you got enough to build it. You know, like, there's all kinds of stuff in the Bible. It's like, don't be, don't be foolish. So how foolish is us to believe, because Satan would want us to, oh, don't, miss, don't manage your money or anything. Don't think about it. Don't think about it in terms of God or anything like that. Just give him 10% and just believe in superstitious magic that you're going to be blessed somehow financially by that. It's never going to happen. And look, most of the people, I have a lot of financial friends, uh, financial planner friends. I tell them all, I'm like, your job is not making much of money in the stock market. It's true. But most of those marriages need somebody to just show them simple budget. <coughs> most people get divorced over money. You know that. They just need simple budgeting, simple <coughs> accountability. Like, just manage your money. You know why? Forbes did this. Now, this is going to sound like I'm you know, pulling out on God. I'm not. Forbes did a thing. They said, why do religious people that give 10% away do better than if they kept their 100%? Is it magic? Forbes is not believing in magic. They're believing in counting numbers and dollars and cents. You know what they found? The reason why Christians can do better on 90% of 100 is because it forces them to budget. It just... You have to budget because you got to find the 10%. And you're, well, we're going to do without 10%. Man, we got to budget to make sure that we can afford to do our stuff. And then you actually budget and you actually keep your money good and you keep each other accountable. And you have more on your 90% because you budgeted because it forced you into a place of budgeting than you would if you'd just done whatever you wanted to with 100%. So it's just basic. It's just common. And to me, I'm seeing all this. I'm like, this makes sense to me. There's a cosmic battle. There's a cosmic war. I think... Poverty? Look, I don't go around. Look, I, I went, I saw uh, in Africa. I don't think God is all into poverty. It's evil. You go look at some people starving to death. Oh, God is good. No. That's spiritual stuff. That's spiritual stuff. That's evil stuff that's been carrying out of human beings. We're supposed to stand up against that. Not right, not acceptable. Take care of the poor. Take care of the oppressed. Take care of the sick. Take care of the people that came. How are you going to take care of them? You can't take care of yourself, but well, we're going to take care of everybody else. Well, no, Christians aren't doing their jobs because we're not worried about taking care of anybody else. 
And they're like, oh, the poor will always be with you. We're just making up excuses because we're not going to deal with it. We don't have to see it. We don't want to worry about it. Well, God, how can God keep blessing us then? Because we're just building bigger barns to store for ourselves. It was never for us. So I think we have to get kingdom-minded. Look back at the first mentions. What was God wanting me and you to be? Kings, queens, rulers, have dominion, carry out his plans. You're God's man. You're God's woman. Who's going to go to the school and be God's man next week? The people that decide that they want to be God's man. The people that get on their face and say, God, I want to do what you want to do. I have to empty myself out. Look, blessed are the poor in spirit. Hey, if it, it said blessed are the poor, I would have understood that. But y'all ever read it's like blessed are the poor in spirit? What does that mean? I thought I was supposed to be strong in spirit. Right? I thought I was supposed to be improving in spirit. No. You're blessed because you're saying, God, I'm totally spiritually bankrupt. I'm totally all bankrupt. I'm totally gone without you. And God says, well, yours is the kingdom of heaven. You got you to gotta submit. The first thing where it says, like, I'm not in charge. I'm not the authority guy. It's not my agenda anymore. I'm running my world. It's doing nothing for me. I'm, and you realize that. Like, you can't do anything with somebody that doesn't realize that. Like, in Proverbs, it says, you see a man that's wise in his own eyes, more hope for a fool than for that guy. Mm -hmm. You ever seen anybody, you can't teach them anything? More hope for a fool. And we're all walking around and we're so good and so arrogant and we want God to bless us. And he's like, it's more hope for a fool. You guys are worse than unbelievers. You guys, are, you're left out on your post. You lost all your authority. You wonder why you're tossed to and fro. You know, you're all in the world trying to make everybody happy. You're giving in to all these fleshly desires. And the whole thing, I mean, look at the wisest man on that earth. We're going to talk about Ecclesiastes. You know, uh, Solomon was blessed. He was wise. He said, God, I want to be wise. He was God's man. God gave him all this wisdom. And then all these women started coming in. He let all his these women turn him away. And you know, Proverbs written while God, he was in a good spot. And Ecclesiastes written when he's like, God messed up with 800 women. And uh, by the end of it, he's like, man, it was all a stupid thing. It was all a bad experience. And then at the very end, he comes back. He's like, but you know what, though? The duty of man is to, is to fear God and to keep his commands. And so, like, yeah, it really does matter, friends, if we decide we want to obey God or not. It really does matter. In fact, in fact, everybody that hates God, that hates the Bible, that doesn't like it, doesn't understand this, thinks Christians are prudes and everything, I guarantee you, I've done it, it's me too. I guarantee you, here's the problem. They're not obeying it. They're not submitting to it. That's the operative language. Like, it will not work until you click Submit your will to him. And remember that will is just yes or no, like choosing God or not choosing. If you submit your will to him and surrender to him, it all becomes operative. It all starts to flow. It, bing, it all turns. And I'm like, how did I not see this? How did I know this? How do other people not realize this? It's because I'm all of a sudden in the flow again. I'm all of a sudden in that life again. And then when I start sinning, moving on, and getting all off, then I'm like, God not, doesn't care about me. No, I behaved myself away from God and, I, and, I, and, I, and I'm not keeping his commands, not trying to love him, not trying to keep his agenda as first in my life, not seeking first the kingdom, but I'm expecting all this stuff to be added. It's crazy. It's like, hey, I know I'm eating a lot of poison, but can you just give me something to make the poison not so poisonous? I'm going to keep eating. And like God's like, quit eating the poison. No, 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 God. I like the poison. Just keep giving it to me. Can you give me an antidote that makes the poison not hurt because I'm going to keep taking the poison? He's like, this dude's done. Until you keep taking the poison of the world and quit trying to make everybody happy and please everybody and fill your own stomach, you're just going to keep having this trouble. And it's not going to work. It's not going to work. It doesn't work. Because why? We're not doing it his way. Jesus says, yeah, unless you forsake all and follow me, you cannot be my disciple. You cannot. You cannot. He's not being ugly. He's just saying, well, it's not going to work. It just cannot. It's like if you don't put on fire stuff and get a hose and go out to the fire, you cannot be a firefighter. You know, it's like it just will not work. And, and we're like, you know, we're like doctors having an affair with the doctor. You know, we're like somebody having an affair with the doctor's wife. And we're like, but I can eat an apple a day. You know, it's like, you're missing it, dude. Like, we're missing the point. You don't keep an apple a day, keep the doctor away because you're sleeping with his wife. 
It's crazy. It's crazy. It's supposed to be kind of funny. I read that. I'm glad y'all thought so. Uh, but preaching to myself, friends, look at your life. I mean, watching soap operas, we're wasting all of our time. Hey, is time money, by the way? So much more valuable. Your time is so much more valuable. If you spend all your time making money, you'll have a bunch of other people's money in no time. And uh, it'll be given away to somebody else. And I can prove to you time's not money. If I were to say to any of y'all, give you a million dollars today, who wants it? I have it. Anyone want it? But, you, but, but your life ends tomorrow. You want the million or you want your life? We'll take the life. Right? Time is not money. We can't be doing this stuff, man. Like, our life is God's. And our hearts are God's. What we need to do is we need to quit believing in superstition and, and magic, and we need to start reading what the Word of God says and putting it into practice. That's it. Look, the safety of interpretation will be held by us because we won't get too far off because we'll be comparing notes and we'll be keeping each other accountable. And friends, I guarantee, uh, because, it, because God is faithful, when we do things His way, it will work out. You run your business God's way. It'll work out. I think so. You know, people want to watch chick fil A's doing good. They put Christian principles in there. And the world hates them for it. Still lines up to get the chicken. So I really do think that God, it, 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 is, it is a blind fool's game. But you can run after God and love him and do fine in this world. And we won't have to fret. Won't have to worry. Won't have to be struggling and scared and living in that thing where we're all tight and worried about it. That's not what God wants us to do. God wants us to be a blessing and be uh, able to help people. Here, here's a good thing, and I'm so sorry we're late, but here's a good thing that you guys can do. You want to know what biblical giving is to me? Look, the, the church won't make it if you guys don't give. I, it, the church down the street won't make it if they don't give. I mean, that's, that's it, you know. But Purpose in your heart to, 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 to put some money away, okay? Decide how much you need. Get you a budget. It'll help you. You'll have a lot more than you need if you stay in budget for a year, okay? Uh, it's a struggle. I know. It's a struggle. Uh, but set aside some money every week, and it's God's money. And you tie it to your church. Do whatever you want. But put some money a little... A little because, because, see... You don't end up giving 10% if you're Jewish. You end up giving like 50 or 60%. It's kind of sad because they want them to like give like free grain offerings and sin offerings and tithe offerings and priest offerings and new moon offerings and festival offerings. And then they're supposed to like do all this stuff. And then like on the seventh year, they're not supposed to do anything. They're supposed to just rest for a whole year. So you got to save your money for six years. And then you're supposed to leave the sides of your field so that the poor people can get that. Like you add it all up and Jewish people are giving a lot away because it wasn't just about them, right? So set aside some money and just don't touch it. You just set aside. And that money might grow. Maybe it'll grow. Maybe $1,000. Maybe $5,000. Maybe $10,000. But when you see a real need, you'll be able to meet that need. I, man, I bet it used to happen all the time. Hey, you need a bus ticket? Hey, this will cut the crap, too. They need $150 to get their bus ticket to you know Minnesota. You'd be like, it's your lucky day, baby. Let's go to the, I will buy the ticket. I'll buy you two. I'll get you some food for the ride. They'd be like, uh, I think it's late. I don't think I'm going to be here today. You're like, uh huh, you didn't need to go to Minnesota. I'm not trying to be that. Way. I'm just saying, but you can meet the need. Uh, my mentor, my old mentor, did this. He kept money for years because you're looking for real needs. God, is that a real need? Because you want to bless. You need to be a blessing. You need to be able, right? You need to always be able to help. Be prepared in season, out season. So you're ready. Equip for every good work. That's what it says. Equip for every good work. So you're ready to bless, to help. And you save it up. You don't know what it's for. My friend did that. He had about $10,000. He'd saved for about six years. God's money. And then he found out in their church there was a family that didn't have insurance and their son had to have a heart uh, surgery. And it cost a whole lot of money. God's money. That's a lot of money. But he knew that was free. And so you'll be a part of God's plan. 
you know, like involved in his work. If you'll take your money and leverage it towards kingdom stuff. You get it? That's it. That's all I have to say. Let me pray, and we'll be done.